All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Culper's Canteen Cup. This is the Christmas episode. We're going to talk about all the gifts uh, that we want that we probably won't get because our family's a bunch of cheap bastards. But uh, anyway, not that any of my family listens to this. Actually, I'm just kidding. My, my father-in-law, he, uh, I think he does still listen to this. So quick shout out to him. But uh, another shout out to Carlton Zeus. Uh, thanks again for the intro music, www.carltonzeus.com or check him out on Apple Music. And we've got a lot of hits on the website, so we appreciate everybody going there. Uh, we try to throw up at least one or two blogs a day, kind of curious, you know, here's some of your feedback and, uh, if you think it sucks or doesn't suck, or you got something that you want to add to it, I think, uh, Luke threw up his first today, which was a meme, which right off the bat. So you, you threw up like basically worthless, you know, army inventions or, you know, uh, changes in policy and uniform and this and that, and you had the PT belt and it's not just the PT belt, right? And those that are in the army or were in the army, you know what we're talking about. It's the whole culture of the PT belt. Cause you know, you're wearing camouflage, but by God, you're going to wear a PT belt to offset the camouflage that you're wearing. And even if you're walking on the sidewalk somewhere, there are no vehicles allowed. You're going to wear a PT belt. So you just in case you don't get hit by a car. So it's the whole culture uh, talking about, you know, the, the vaccine that I guess the, was it the army or the military? I think it was the army, right? The vaccine that the army is going to create. Um, so let me tell you this up front, having worked with a lot of folks in the army, the last thing I want to inject in myself is something created <laughs> by another soldier. One, I may have actually put that soldier in. So there might be, uh, some, some <laughs> quality control issues there. <laughs> But, but the last thing I'm putting in my body is something that a, another soldier uh, created. Uh, but th the big one that, that caught me, man, was the uh, it was the Black Beret. I mean, Luke, you created the meme. So, I mean, I, for the love of God, dude, why the Black Beret? Why'd they have to go black? Right. So you already had uh, you already had green. Right. You already had a black. So why did not we just go tan? I mean, what was the whole point? Which uh -huh. Shinseki, it was General Shinseki. Uh, who, by the way, did a fantastic job when he transitioned over to the VA uh, and did absolutely nothing for 24 months over there. But, uh, you know, during his, 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 the only thing that I remember this guy from, you know, four star general, right? You know, uh, chief of staff in the army, and this and that is, um, yeah, he, he came out with the Black Beret and made me buy a bunch of useless shit that I may or may not have worn over the last, you know, several years of my career. The Black Beret. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that was just such a bad call. And it, peak army stupidity occurred to me after I made the meme. It's like peak army stupidity is someone standing there in ACUs with a Black Beret and a PT belt, which I have seen. <laughs> I think all three of us have seen it. And we're coming out of peak. We're starting to come out of peak army uniform stupidity. And all of a sudden they have a vaccine that's going <laughs> to defend against all variants. It's like injecting the Black Beret ACUs and a PT belt into your body. It's just not a good idea. But yeah, I, the Black Beret is just a bad idea, man. The Rangers were all mad about it because they were Black Berets. And it would, you're right, it would have made much more sense to go with the Tan Beret because I, I think that looks pretty sharp, the uh, Tan Beret yeah. on the Rangers. I mean, you could have at least tied that in with like the whole World War II, you know, like the, like the new uniform now, right? I mean, you could have yeah. used that history. But no, we'll just go ahead and take that unit's history and uh, you can go get your own. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, my, my main memory of the Black Beret, right, is... You know, I was already in uh, the 525, so we were already wearing Maroon Berets, and we were downrange in Kosovo when the policy took effect. And it was after September 11th when everybody had to switch over to the Black Beret, and it was like the final day. So we were attached to the 101st Airboard, and the rest of us who already had the Maroon Beret on were sitting up in the stands. And it was when we were on our way back from Kosovo. We were at, you know, CRC or something. And so the entire, like the 101st, you know, MI battalion or whatever it was, was standing in front of us. We're in the stands <laughs> and they do the parade <laughs> ceremony. And these four jokers who have never worn berets all put on their black berets at the same time. And it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen because those berets were all messed up. They look oh, like, oh yeah, a, not shaved. A bunch of French, French pizza makers. And there was a dude uh, named Kevin Green. I don't know if you guys know him. He doesn't listen. I haven't seen him in years, so I'll say his whole name, Sergeant Green. He just started in this quiet, giant gym, started laughing, like belly laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was just ridiculous. Bad idea. You know, don't fix it if it ain't broken. Shinseki, that guy was a joke. Um, but, yeah, I. I do not want a black beret for Christmas. Roger, what, what are you hoping you get for Christmas? What do you know you won't get? 
So I already know I'm getting an Apple Watch for Christmas. I have the V1 Apple Watch. And what I've learned from the Nintendos and the Ataris and the Commodore 64s and the iPhones, I'm not throwing this bad boy away because it still works. So my Apple Watch V1, I'm going to like put that thing in my little food saver thing, suck all the air out of it, throw it in a, in a trunk and keep it there for, you know, 10 years and then maybe try to sell it on eBay for like, you know, $1,000 or something like that down the road. So I know I'm getting a new Apple Watch. Other than that, uh, you know, we pretty much buy, especially now my kids are grown, man. We buy stuff, you know, throughout the year as, as we want, you know, as we want it or whatever. Um, so I, that's the, that's the big gift. Other than that, I'll probably get some booze and some chocolates. My wife always does the, the stuffing or you know, stocking stuffers. Cause I, I like my little candies. I don't eat them all the time, but I, I like my little Snickers bars and Mike's and Ike's and, and a lot of the good stuff. But real quick, before I throw it back to you, it was actually funny because when you were coming up with this meme and I was in a bad connection area, so I was just typing this stuff up. So Luke sends out, Hey, other than ACUs and you need to go to the website, check out his blog. Uh, other than the ACUs and the, and the BlackBerry, give me another bad army idea or two. There are so many bad <laughs> army ideas. So, you know, it's like affirmative action, centralized promotion with no feedback. Warrant officers, my personal favorite. Should have actually put a picture of Josh up there. Um, <laughs> PT belts, PT uniforms, the ACFT, the APFT, body fat calculator. And it just becomes like, man, this is just never ending. So then we had to get some context, something that uh, Josh is great at providing. Uh, to what he needed this for. Then we saw the the meme pop up. So anyway, uh, throw it back to you real quick, Luke. What are you hoping to get for Christmas? Uh, what do you know you're getting? What do you know that you're not getting? And, and what, do you, what did you get? What did you get, Michelle? Just between me, you, Josh, and, and the 14 other listeners. Yeah, she she won't listen uh, before this comes out, uh, unlike unlike your wife, Roger, where we learned the hard way last year that Roger's wife will actually listen to the podcast. <laughs> Well, she'll listen to the podcast that. when Luke is like, hey, you should listen to the podcast because he's going to, you know. <laughs> so just that between was... me, you, Josh, and Michelle, what'd you get her? Okay. Uh, I got, you know, we we kind of agreed to kind of go small this year. So I got her like little gifts. Um, like I got her a, a candle, but under the candle, I gave her like a gift card to um, uh, Duluth Trading Company, you know, because she loves Duluth. And then I got her and stuff. Hmm? Oh yeah. They yeah. Make women stuff? No kidding. Yeah. Right? Yep. So, and then I got her like something else. Uh, I got her some, uh, we want a kayak at night next summer, next spring and summer. And you have to have, you're supposed to have lights on your kayak. So, or any, some kind of light. So I got her a, a Petzl light headlamp and underneath that is an Academy gift card. Cause she needs a bunch of new workout clothes, you know? And then she really loves that. What is it called? Rare earth trading company. It's like the place in the mall that smells like patchouli. It's like the hippie store. <laughs> she loves that place. <laughs> so, so I got her a gift card from there and put that on something else. So just, you know, just so she can shop for herself. Um, it's, I'm not going to say she's hard to shop for, but I think I used up a lot of my creativity years ago. And I don't know, I, it, she always gets me stuff that I can use and need. So, uh, I'm sure I'll get, uh, stuff that I probably been talking about, but I would never buy myself, you know, nothing too expensive. And the cool thing is, is I'll be surprised about it. Uh, but what I have to do, and I'm sure you guys are the same, maybe, is I have to just like turn off my Amazon notifications because otherwise I'll know what I'm getting because she'll order it from Amazon and it comes to my account. Hey, your package is on the way. What well, you know they do the family that? thing now. So oh, they do. You have, yeah. yeah, you have one Prime account and then like my kids, my wife, that way you can go and order whatever. It, they have their own account, but it's set to your, basically okay. you're buying your own shit. So what's happening. Okay. Well, we'll, 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 we'll hook that up. Uh, That's what we do. But yeah, you know, when I sent you that, that message earlier this morning, I literally came up with, and it's not a great idea. It's just, I thought it was kind of funny when I saw that headline of the army coming up with the miracle magazine. And I, when I sent you that message, uh, I re immediately realized what a stupid thing to ask because all the, all the dumb ideas the army's had, like the force 21 and that self-propelled artillery, the Avenger or something like that. <laughs> Just so many bad ideas. But yeah, Roger came back, like he said, with a list of like 21 things. Just boop, 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 boop. And I'm like, PT belt, got to go with that. So here's the thing. You know, we we got Josh something. The cup came together and decided to get Josh a Christmas gift. And this Christmas gift suits a number of purposes. And one purpose is, this is his hint, it's to shut him up. It's to shut him up for a little while. So... Without further ado, Josh, uh, when I'll show the audience the uh, the package that it's in and maybe open it up and describe how it's going as you're opening it. 
Yeah, let me uh, let me reach behind my. While he does this, you know, I, I, and you need to plug this, especially next year. I'm actually very excited next year for Christmas because I, I'm very bad at Christmas cards. So we don't do Christmas cards here. It's one of those that my wife's like, hey, we need to do the family photo and do it in front of the tree with the dogs and send it out to everybody. And I think I got one from Luke's parents and I got one from Josh and his family. So, you know, it's pretty cool. And, and it kind of gets me some hot water because Summer's like, oh, we should have done this again. Uh, and we didn't do it. But Luke's wife paints Christmas cards. Uh, watercolor, I believe, right? And this year she was a little late to the parade, but I'm stoked because next year, and I think we get we got a plugger because she has agreed that she would not only hand paint the Christmas card for me to send out to all my friends and family or whatever, but actually write the message in there for me. Um, and I'll even pay for the stamps. So I'll pay for the stamps. I might have a little explaining to do why. Uh, these things are all postmarked, you know, Texas or whatever, but the cool thing is they're all done by hand. I thought, I mean, they look pretty badass, dude. So hopefully next year, you know, maybe like uh, November timeframe, uh, you know, start kicking that out there and, uh, we could probably get some of the, uh, C3 folks out there to, to, to place some orders, but super yeah, stoked man. about it. Yeah. She did. They, they went over pretty well. People really like them. Um, and Josh there is, I told him to, to kind of prep it and he obviously did. Oh, he's opening it up folks. I prepped it. Okay. He prepped it about the, as much uh, as he did for this show in the outline. What do you got? Pull it out. <laughs> the, dude, the last time I did an outline, you guys got upset. And you called me Hitler and everything. So you know what? <laughs> so so F your outline. Um, okay. What do you got there? I don't know. I got to get... Dude, I don't know whoever packed this, but I don't think they have any more painter's tape left. You owe me the presents. You open presents like old people make love. Like really old people. Slow and clumsy. <laughs> how do you know how they do that? Because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's coming out of the box. I it's coming out of the box, folks. Here we go. I figured it was from Dan when I saw the uh, song. This play is my play. This would be much more exciting on YouTube for those people. Go straight to YouTube and watch Josh open presents like old people. <laughs> we'll just make a gift out of it over and over with him like ripping off the painter's tape. <laughs> Good Lord, Josh. <laughs> oh, oh, what does it say? It's the USS flag with CVN 99. Yeah, that's a G.I. Joe aircraft carrier. So from now on, you cannot complain that this is the 33rd year I haven't gotten the G.I. Joe <laughs> aircraft carrier. There you go, man. USS flag, CVN 99. I, I love it. Here we go. <laughs> For our YouTube viewer, viewers, so you can see it. I see, that's, it. I finally, that turned out really good. I appreciate that. I finally that. got my G.I. Joe aircraft carrier. Thank that was, you. That was a uh, ginger inferno flags put that together, and uh, we want to hear Josh. We, we don't want to hear him say he hasn't gotten it again. So there you go. There's your GI Joe aircraft carrier. I was just getting ready to. Uh, I do. I had already found that meme and like prepped it because I was gonna. That was gonna be like my first post on uh, on Saturday morning. <laughs> now we're gonna put fake can't. news. That's right. Now it's fake news. Thank you. Yeah. No, I I appreciate that. And Dan yeah. over at Ginger Inferno Flags, we plugged him a couple of times, but he did that. And again, I mean, his his work is is, is getting pretty daggum solid. I mean, not that it wasn't to begin with, but it's good to watch him grow and get better. Uh, but if you head over to our webpage under the blog, Small Businesses, we have a link to his Facebook, Instagram, uh, you know, for the price and, and the quality. I mean, you can't beat it, but fantastic job. That's awesome. No, I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Luke and Roger. And uh, and thanks to uh, to Dan for uh, for doing that. Yeah. Um, Cause I know he's busy, you know, watching his social media. He's, he's got a lot of new, uh, new stuff coming out. And like you said, some of his ideas and, you know, stuff that he's doing down there is fantastic. So you guys get on the socials and, uh, and get over to ginger inferno flags and, uh, check them out and, uh, and, and get some stuff from them. You, you definitely will not be disappointed. Um, so, well, I know one thing I got for Christmas that, uh, the other thing, so hey, Mike, you know, we're kind of like Roger at this point. It's kind of like, you know, I buy some things throughout the year. There, there are certain things that I won't buy for myself because I don't like to spend a lot of money on myself uh, for the most part. But uh, 
Joel got me an uh, an Apple Watch. Uh, so it's not the uh, it's not the, the the newest and latest. I think it's a V three. Um, so, but you know, it's my first one. Um, I like it. It's uh, dude, it's super super handy. I found myself now. I don't, I, you know, I don't have my phone uh, you know nearby me as much as I used to. So, but because I got you know I got that thing on. Um, so it's pretty handy. Uh, I don't know what else I've gotten. Uh, as far as like what I want, like, I mean, I want a lot of things. Um, you know, I'd love to have a couple of new guns. Um, you know, I'd like to have some more, uh, some more booze, but you know, <laughs> the, no, nobody, nobody's getting me guns and booze for, uh, you know, for Christmas. Not so this group. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. No, it's all good, man. Um, you know, I, it, Christmas now, especially with the kids, you know, still being still being in the house, you know, Christmas is really, you know, we're kind of geared toward them. You know, we'll open up a few things, uh, but it's really for the, you know, it's more for the kids. I we enjoy watching them, you know, open some stuff and and be happy. Um, as far as what I've gotten her, uh, I would say it, but I have it done Don't be Christmas. Scared. I haven't That's done my scary. Christmas shopping yet. When are you going to go out and buy her? What are you going to go out and buy her? Go just say it. So tomorrow I'm going out to do Christmas shopping. Um, for <laughs> her. I haven't done it yet, dude. I haven't done it. I, I, dude, I, I am the absolute worst when it comes to like Christmas shopping. Um, I like, dude, right, I'm, that's great. Hey, hey, Jen Saki. So what are you going to buy her? I'm terrible. Um, and uh, so I'm going to go over to uh, the spa over at the uh, Pinehurst Resort and uh, get her a spa package over there because um, it's, oh, there it's super swanky um, and they, uh, you know, they do a good job. Plus, when you go over there for the spa, then you get access to everything else at the resort for the day. Um, so I'm going to do that. And she's, uh, you know, she's gotten really, really into, uh, you know, into yoga. And uh, so I'm going to get her, you know, get her some stuff for that, probably some new uh uh, she's got a new, brand new mat, um, but I'll get her some, you know, little kind of like stocking stuffers uh, type things for for yoga class. Um, in fact, we're going in the morning. We went yesterday. Um, we're going in the morning. Got a seven thirty class, and uh, she got me into it, man. I actually, dude, I love it. Um, now you're not good. actually counting that. Well, a couple of things. One, you 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 should be having a, a great thing or a great Christmas because you've completed seventy five hard. So you'll be yeah. able to drink, eat, and all that other stuff. But you're not counting yoga as part of your 45 minutes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, so once you, you tell us, you, how, so how you've obviously, 70- n- so you've obviously never done a yoga, uh, a yoga so workout. How how did 75 hard end up? You finished it up what last week or beginning of this week? So I finished it up uh, last uh, Friday. The 17th was our last day. I woke up on the uh, the morning of the 18th, the free man. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> allowed to eat and drink whatever i want uh saturday was uh saturday was five guys uh you know for for dinner i would dude i was like i want a burger i want a, just a greasy cheeseburger and some fries so i crushed that and uh then i had uh i was like all right man we're breaking out the uh we're gonna break out the the bourbon and i think i had one drink and i passed out on the couch um <laughs> That was, uh, that was, uh, that was, that was that. Um, so yeah. So finish it up, uh, 21, uh, 20, well, 20, like 20.6, uh, pounds overall. Um, good but, job, uh, man. That's yeah, awesome. man. It was, it, it was good. It was good. Um, and, uh, I actually like, you know, come I, dude, after I had that, uh, dinner Saturday night, like I felt, dude, I felt so bad. Like I, like I physically felt just like, ugh. like I don't like that did not bring me joy. Um, and, uh, so, you know, it kind of set it up now to where, you know, Monday through, uh, really Sunday through Sunday through Friday, I'm going to do what I want, you know, or work out and eat good and stuff like that. Saturday, I'm just going to stuff my face, um, and, you know, do whatever I want. No drinking, uh, you know, unless it's Saturday and, uh, you know, just try and try and maintain. I don't want to put it all back on. Um, no, dude, I, I like it. You look thinner. I've got more real estate, more screen space because your head's smaller. So it's uh, <laughs> it's easy, man. 
<laughs> you know, I, I joke about it. But it's like, man, I got some jeans that are getting tight. And it's like, yeah, I might, uh, I, I might start 75 hard again after this show. Nah, and, you just uh, need a new, and, you just need a new dryer. You just need a new dryer. <laughs> That's right. No, dude, that was the other part, man. Dude, that guy, it's like, I started trying on some clothes that, you know, I haven't been able to wear, you know, in a couple of months, well, let's in like a year. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I was like, damn, dude, I fit in these again. Like, like dude, so that was another part of like Christmas, man. It was Christmas all over again. I got a whole new wardrobe now. Oh, um, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So that's, uh, that's what's going, that's what's going on here. So we have had a pretty busy week going into Christmas. I thought it was going to be a lot slower. Um, and now that I'm back from our camping trip. So th- so we went camping. And I think we were going to try to record over the weekend. And whenever we go, because I, I work from home or whatever, work on the road. And we always pull up the website and like, hey, what's the cell phone signal like? And this and that to make sure I can do work and, and my wife as well, uh, whatever. So we pull it up on the website and it says, hey, it's got like three bars, Verizon, T-Mobile. So we have both. Like, should be good to go. I'll take my stuff out with me or whatever. So, uh, Alamo Lake place is beautiful. Fantastic. Great fishing. Uh, you know, there's some, uh, you see some coyotes out there and, and, and a bunch of mules and all that other good stuff. Um, but there's absolutely no signal. You are digital boondocking, uh, which is not a bad thing if you're prepared for it, but I'm talking about no air TV antenna, no channels. Um, nothing uh as far as you know the radio goes and we're talking about fm and am and no cell phone signal so you have to like hike up to the the top of a hill you get like one bar so i can text my kids and it was a good time and i'm you know we were out there for like four days or whatever but i tell you what man if you're not prepared for that stuff it's hard because i didn't have any you know if if you're going to do it and you're like okay i know there's no signal i'm going to bring some books uh, I'm going to bring, you know, some magazines or some things to read. If it wasn't for like the top 200 playlists that I had downloaded on my Apple phone, uh, it'd have been, uh, it'd have been a struggle. But anyway, during that time while I was out there, we got to catch some news a little bit. And I found that that was one of the things I missed the most. It wasn't even uh social media or the internet so much. It was just being out of the loop of the news and just hearing what's going on. But, uh, we got a couple of things we're going to cover this week. And I guess I'll start off first with, uh, Gisley Maxwell. Because uh, one of our one of our listeners or viewers was asking as far as keeping them up to date. So the trial is over. Uh, they're going into deliberations now. Uh, it was 12 days. This thing was expected to go six to eight weeks uh, as far as back and forth with the prosecution and defense and then closing out again with the prosecution. Uh, jury has been deliberating since Monday. Uh, prosecution called a total of 24 witnesses. Four of those witnesses uh, were victims um, or alleged victims. And the defense called eight witnesses, uh, and I'll kick this around to both of you guys to kind of see, you know, what your thoughts are on it. You know, and I only read bits and pieces and caught some video uh, because I'm not sure how much of this stuff was actually uh, televised anywhere. But everything led up to Maxwell grooming underage women uh, for Epstein. And I didn't hear or read anything overly graphic. It was just a lot of, uh, you know, and I shouldn't say overly graphic, but some of it I think was very subjective. I think there were some details that were very sketch, Uh, whether they're true or not or whatever. I I, I didn't follow their lifestyle enough. I know Epstein was convicted uh, prior on on some earlier charges with something like that and was given some type of immunity or whatever. But I think what bothers me the most is, well, one, I really liked her. her response to the judge when, when he was like, Hey, you have the right to, to get up and, and defend yourself and make a statement, yada, yada, yada. She's like, Hey, the burden of proof. And I'm paraphrasing here. The burden of proof is uh, on the government and they haven't brought that. So I don't need to get up and say anything. And I tell you what, to me, I mean, and who knows what the jury, I, I don't know what the jury was uh, composed of, uh, uh, you know, men, women or anything like that, but it's like, wow, that's, a, that's a pretty strong statement to me. And, and everything I've been able to read in the news and follow in this thing, it's just, it's a lot of vague, you know, subjective quote unquote facts, this and that. But I think the biggest problem I have with this, Josh, maybe you have, uh, maybe you have some insight to this, but, and I don't want to take away from victims, um, you know, that were actually abused, actually assaulted, groomed, what have you, but this stuff, some of the stuff was like 20, 30 years ago. And that's my problem with a lot of this stuff. It's like one lady was interviewed by the FBI. One victim was, was intervi- interviewed by the FBI, you know, in the early 2000s or 2007. They're like, hey, why didn't you bring this up then? 
like, well, it wasn't about, you know, Epstein or whatever, it was about something, some other sexual assault. I was like, well, don't you think this would have been like a prime time to kind of bring that up? And, and it's not even that they weren't victims, but when you look at 20 or 30 years ago, I mean, dude, I can barely tell you what I ate for breakfast this morning. Okay. Without conflating it with what I ate yesterday for breakfast. Right. So when you're talking about specific incidents that happened 20, 30 years ago, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Do you have any insight on why this took so long? I mean, I think at the end of the day, we all know. I mean, Max, you know, Maxwell, she is the scapegoat. Epstein's dead. We all talked about the people that are involved. You know, they were throwing names like Trump out there, Prince Andrew, uh, throwing the Clintons out there. And so there were so many high profile players up there. And, and, and from what I read, uh, they said that the prosecution offered no plea deal. The defense uh, didn't seek any plea deal. So uh, to me, the way I read those tea leaves is like, hey, there's a lot of people that are like, hey, this ain't going any farther. She is the scapegoat. She is Ollie North. She's taking this fall uh, if she gets convicted. But I'm not entirely sure she gets convicted. But going back to my, my original question, why 20, 30 years? I mean, uh, you know, I know Epstein had some issues early on, but that seems a little, uh, you know, that seems like quite a bit, you know, a long time ago to be bringing that stuff forward and, and expecting some type of, you know, articulate, you know, detail or account of what happened, you know, three decades ago. Yeah. So I followed it as much as I could. And, you know, like you, from what I gathered and, you know, a lot of it is it, hard because it wasn't, you know, obviously it, it wasn't obviously televised, you know, like the, like the Rittenhouse trial or anything like that. So, you know, you were only getting, what we were getting was already being filtered, you know, once. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to figure out, you know, what's here or there. But a lot of the testimony, it did. It seemed very circumstantial. It was, you know, very much, well, you know, they they, they, they kind of asked me to do this. Okay, did they directly tell you to do it? Well, no, but that's what they, yeah, that's how I inferred it and stuff like that. And it's right. like, okay, it's like, hey, man, that's fine. You know, I mean, you know, that is not the burden of proof. Like, you know, it's like, okay, well, I can say one thing. How are you? How you interpret that? you know, it's something entirely different. Unless I say something like I'm going to kill you um, or, you know, go kill that person. You know, that's, I, I, I don't, I don't know that she gets convicted. Um, and then, you know, like you, when she opted not to take the stand where, you know, it's like, okay, Hey, the burden's of proof on the prosecution. They have brought it. I don't, I, hey, I'm going to just stay quiet. I don't need to say anything. Um, man, I, I don't, I don't know that she's going to get convicted based off of that. Um, and especially, like you said, the information is from, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And, you know, at that point, you, you know, everybody, everybody wants to, you know, discredit the witness. You know, the other side always wants to discredit the witness I'm like that. It's like 20, 30 years ago. Dude, I could not tell you what went on 20, 30 years ago, you know, in every single situation that I've, you know, that I've been in. I'm just like, dude, I don't know. Like 20, 30 years ago, it's like, are there pictures? Is there a video? Like, cause I don't, dude, I don't remember that. I'm like you, man, two weeks ago, I couldn't tell you what I had for lunch. Um, so the, and I think you're, I think you're spot on dude. The, the names that were coming out, especially when the pilot, right? So if you remember when the pilot testified and the pilot logs, when the pilot logs came back, they were so heavily redacted that they couldn't tell. There were some flights that the only person's name that showed up was the pilot. All the other names on that flight at that time were redacted. My question is, why are the names redacted? Is it a matter of national security? Are those people underage? Are they minors? No? Then why are their names redacted? Are you, you know worried why they're about redacted? It? Well, I know why. I know why they're redacted, right? Are you worried about a defamation lawsuit? No. And that was, I think, that was the you know the entire thing. The, the well, the one thing that I wanted out of this trial were names. I wanted names. I wanted names of everybody who visited you know Epstein Island, visited his place in Florida, you know, visited his place in New York. Like I wanted names, and especially if they were elected officials. Oh, hell no. I want the names, but we're never going to get that. Um, and, you know, the black helicopters will tell you that they intentionally 
kind of, you know, the defense kind of intentionally through through the game here, um, you know, so she doesn't get convicted to keep her quiet. They go, it was, hey, we have to go through this or, you know, you have to do it um, at this point. But don't worry, you're going to go, you know, you're going to walk at the end of this um, as long as as long as you keep names out of it. Because if it came down to it and it was like, oh, you're not even going to offer me a plea deal. OK, fine. Like, I do this. If I'm going down, like I am burning the entire thing down with me. And I'd be like, yeah, put me on the stand. And dude. I just get up there and start naming names. Be like, where were you on the evening? Be like, Bill Clinton. You know, <laughs> like, dude, I would just start naming names. Um, every question would be like, how are you doing today? I'd be like, Ernie Finkelstein. Like, dude, it would just be name after name after name. Um, I, but there's, I, I think there's too many powerful people involved that they are, uh, you know, they, they, they want this to go away. In 12 days, really? You guys ran a trial for somebody who has possibly abused and exploited hundreds of underage girls over the period of decades, and that trial closed up in 12 days? Really? That's that's very telling. I mean, you know, how long... Dude, how long did the OJ trial last? Jesus. And that was, And that was too, you know two people dead in one evening and a matter, you know, that that whole trial only covered like three hours worth of, you know, time. And how long did that one last? No, this dude, and especially as convoluted and stuff, you know, this was there, there's, yeah, it, it, it drives me nuts, but I think, uh, you know, as par for the course with, uh, with this, uh, with this administration. Now here's the, here's the question. If she walks, how long? How long before she uh, Clintons herself? I don't know. I think if she walks, I, I think she's fine, right? I mean, to me, knowing and again, it, it's we've talked about this during the Rittenhouse trial. You kind of have to take what you, what you read, you know, with a grain of salt, because uh, like we talked about, the one guy that uh, you know went after Kyle with the handgun. When you, you know, fortunately we were able to sit there and hear it and hear the complete testimony, but that's not what came out in the news. And so that's what kind of gives me some pause when I read this stuff and you, you know, you try to be as objective as possible in this stuff. But from what I've read and what I've been able to see and, and hear from the, the news reporting, both local and national, I mean, it's like you said, there was no smoking gun. I mean, there's no video, there's no name like, Hey, this person, you know, one grooming is hard to prove. I think in general, just because of the way it's done, it's extremely hard to groom. Uh, you're, you're talking about something that takes, you know, months, if not years, right, of grooming. Uh, so it's hard to prove. And then you add on two or three decades becomes even, you know, more difficult uh, to prove. But I didn't see or hear of any like concrete evidence, videos, photos. It was just a lot of uh, where well, they were erotic massages. Okay, which you're wrong. I get it. I'm not saying that that's not right or whatever, but sure. it's like you have to have some proof right after two or three decades. So my, you know, my initial thought is I'm not sure she gets convicted on anything seriously. Uh, and then if she goes free, I mean, that might be in the best interest of, of her and uh, the prosecution and the other high profile people that, you know, their names were redacted from the flight logs. Maybe that's what they're depending on. Because looking at the, the charges, so she's got, uh, she's charged with two counts of violating the Mann Act which is basically transporting people across state lines for illegal sexual activities. Now, by the way, uh, this is how great the prosecution, it, prosecution is. Of the two charges, one was actually of age. So you can just take one of those charges and throw it out. They're like, well, no, she got transported to, and I, I don't know what the state was. I think it was like New Mexico or whatever. And they're like, well, she was 16 and 16 in New Mexico at that time is of age, you know, for consent or whatever it is. Like, well, yeah, but the intent was, his intent was, now not hers, his intent was, to bring an, a, a minor under age across state lines for sexual activity. And she groomed her for that. Yeah. You know, that's the type of stuff and, you're dealing with. And that, and that, you know, intent is incredibly hard to prove and, you know, in itself. And, you know, that's an easy objection right there to be like, you're testifying to the intent of someone who is dead. Really? Yep. Go prove, go, go prove that. Um, I, so she's got two charges of that, and then she's got one charge of sex trafficking a minor and one charge of sex trafficking conspiracy. Uh, and I think one of those is actually that same lady 
um, that was of age, you know, when they took her to New Mexico or whatever. So, you know, of the four, you know, best case, maybe you've got three, possibly even two charges. And, and like you said, I don't even know she gets convicted of either of those. I mean, you know, I don't know what type of uh, theatrics were involved or whatever, but, you know, and, and I'm again, I'm paraphrasing, but go back and read what she's, you know, what she stated is like, hey, burden of proofs on the government. The government hasn't proved anything. I don't need to say anything. I mean, why defend yourself if they haven't proven anything? I mean, to me, dude, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. No, man, it was, uh, it was definitely a smart move on her part. I mean, granted, I would like to see her, uh, you know, it wouldn't hurt my feelings to, I don't wish death on anybody, but it wouldn't hurt my feelings to read her obituary. Uh, but before that happens, like I, I dude, I want the, na- like I want names. Like I want to know who, um, you know, because those people, those people need to burn, burn and burn. Um, never happen. Never happen. No, 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 it'll, it, it'll absolutely, absolutely never happen. Um, but maybe, maybe that's what I want for, that's what I want for Christmas right there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I want names and I want those, uh, I want those people to, uh, be held accountable. Now, what if she's found guilty and goes to prison? And I did run through the scenario in my head. She's found guilty, goes to prison, because I think she faces up to like 70 years in jail or whatever, which is it's a life sentence for her. So let's say she gets yeah. the full gamut, right? She's convicted, goes to prison. Uh, maybe then some names come out, and then you just roll the dice. Hey, I'm going to throw some names out there uh, for a reduced sentence, maybe time served. And uh, I just hope that I don't get suicided by you know any of these folks, uh, a.k.a. the Clintons. Uh, while I'm out on the streets, you know, I don't know how much money she has left. And I think she was probably paid millions for, if I remember what I read, but I don't know if she just tries to disappear or go off the grid. But I think the only way that you, that we hear any names from her uh, will be after the fact. And I'm not even sure what they can do after the fact. If they're like, okay, you've been convicted. We can reduce your sentence now if you provide, you know, whatever names. But at the same time, I, you know, I think those people are so high, high profiled. It's like we mentioned, the prosecution didn't even offer a plea deal because they don't want it. They don't want it. They just, Hey, you need to be convicted or found innocent or whatever the case is. And this needs to be done and over with. This needs to just move on. Yeah. Well, that right there. I mean, the fact that the prosecution, you know, didn't offer a plea deal, um, you know, that right there tells you all you need to know about, Hey man, they just want this thing or they are being pressured to make this thing just go away, but just go away. Like the plea deal, but there's no, for the, you know, for them to take a look at and be like, okay, well, you know, give us the names, you know, the other folks, you know, and we're not saying you'll have immunity, right? You can have a plea deal without having immunity. Um, but you know, we'll, you know, you'll be tried for a lesser charge or whatever. Um, but you do that. Like it was nothing. It wasn't even, it wasn't even that, which tells me they have no intent on no intention on pursuing this, you know, past her, like you said, she's, she is the Ollie North. They're going to be like, you know what? If she get if she gets convicted, um, they're gonna be like, all right, yep, justice sir, we got him. You know, hey man, the uh, the you know the Epstein uh, saga is uh, is over and done with, never to be you know spoken of again. You know, never mind the fact that there's a whole lot of people out there that uh, you know have gotten away with it. Um, so, I'm waiting for the book. Waiting for the book. Oh yeah, I. She, uh, you know, it's funny and it, it's, it's another thing we, you know, we, we were talking earlier, you know, we, we've done it on multiple episodes talking about the media, right. And how just what garbage our media is. Um, and I don't know if you saw the post from the Atlantic, uh, that came out and, you know, it, it, it basically, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here. It was like, you know, is there really a, a you know, a child sex trafficking problem? You know, is yeah. it, is that really an issue when a couple of years ago, you know, they talked about uh, be like, hey, there's, you know, there's a child sex exploitation, you know, uh, crisis in, you know, not only in the United States, but around the globe. And lo and behold, they put that, you know, second article out. This is, you know, post Epstein. They put, you know, it's like, well, is it really a problem? And then I forget her name, but the founder of the Atlantic is photographed hanging out poolside with of all people Ghislaine Maxwell you know and you're like oh okay that's what that's why we're doing it now (laughs) yeah now it makes man now it makes perfect sense um but that's dude you got these 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 people these prominent individuals and you know influential positions man and uh it goes back to I think it was uh Luke that was saying 
you know, talking about uh, Josh Duggar who got convicted, you know, and it comes down to it, it's like, dude, what drives people to that? Like, absolutely, like, what drives people to that? And uh, I think Luke had a pretty, you know, a, a pretty good uh, re- you know, reasoning for it. It was like, the, you know, people who are, have the money, um, you know, who have generational wealth, not, you know, not wealth you can, you know, not like, you know, you can lose over a long summer in a drug habit, but like generational wealth, <laughs> um, you know, it's like they can buy anything. They, there's nothing, they have no, they have no wants because they can just go do it and they have to do something that, you know, is so taboo, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to get that rush or do whatever, uh, because everything else and we're like, Hey man, you want to go on a, you know, 180 day John around the world? Be like, yeah, we'll do it. All right, let's go. You know, there's not, there's just nothing that they can't, can't buy. Um, and, you know, so it comes down to like a thrill for them, which boggles my mind, but. Yeah, I guess you got that kind of money, you can get away with anything, right? So there, you know, every day is Christmas for you. So it's like, hey, what's, like you said, it's what's going to give me the next high. And a lot of times it's the illegal activity because it, it is illegal. So on to the next thing. So yesterday I heard, uh, and I'm not sure if you got a chance to listen to all of Biden's speech. Did you, did you get a chance to hear Biden's speech in, in Saki before that? No. So he basically came out and it was funny. One, it's just creepy, man. When he gets that whisper, you got to do it. You got to yeah. do it. It's like, why, why, who are you whispering at? Like, why are you whispering to me? You're a national TV in front of a mic. But long story short, he comes out and, and he talks about, um, you know, all the things they're doing to combat, you know, Omicron and, and COVID and this and that. And a couple of things I took away from this and then I'll get your thoughts on it. But one, everything he listed that they're doing, it, it was nothing new. It's stuff that we've already been doing. Uh, what he did highlight, and, and it wasn't intentional, was, and I think he even answered a question on this, but they didn't stockpile any of this stuff for like the vaccines, the testing sites, none of that stuff, right? We are too, and here, here's my problem. This goes on to the, to, to the broader point of, uh, or the broader MO of his, of his administration, in my opinion. He's reactive. They are reactive to everything, you know, and, and when they, when he was asked about, well, you know, why didn't we see this coming and this and that he's like, nobody could have seen this coming. It just happened overnight. I'm like, dude, I think we've all pretty much called this. I think all of our listeners knew this. I mean, it's like, Hey, we don't have to be, you know, virologists or scientists or anything to say, Hey, there's going to be new variants. Uh, some are going to be extremely contagious. You're going to sit there and pump out, hey, everybody needs to go get tested before you meet up with your family and friends this holiday. But oh, by the way, there aren't enough tests out there. Uh, some of these places in New York, they're talking about people waiting in line like seven or eight hours, which I would never do. You know, more power to them. Uh, I'm not waiting in line seven or eight hours for for a test uh, for that. But it's like, yeah, actually, people did see this coming. The former CDC director, uh, Redfield, uh, actually called it. I mean, he called it back in like August. He said, Hey, there are going to be new variants. There are going to be some that are extremely contagious. We need to be stockpiling this stuff now. But a couple other things I took from this before I go back to his reactiveness is everything is about the vaccine and testing. So vaccines are out there. Uh, testing is out there, but not necessarily available, uh, for everybody. And again, there are a lot of folks that, um, aren't available or aren't able to get the testing because of the wait times. And depending on where you're at, they're just, they're just out of stock. Uh, I know out here in our area, our neck of the woods, I think Mesa had some, our library's given out some tests for at home. Mesa had some and they were out in the first two hours, but basically his only option is vac- vaccines. It's to get vaccinated period. And it makes you wonder, it's like, Hey, how come you're not talking about the monoclonal antibody treatments? That I think I heard the number today, they've only ordered like, uh, it's some small number, it was like 5 million of those things. Uh, the Pfizer pills, like 50,000 of those that, are, that have been proven effective, right? Uh, not that I want to take the pill or not, but again, these are these are other courses of action outside of the vaccine um, and, and, and other therapeutics. I mean, we were light years ahead of where we were a year ago or two years ago just because of other therapeutics, but it's like the only option is to get vaccinated. Uh, and so it brought me into two things. It's like, one, it's it's the reactiveness of this administration to everything. And it's 
not just COVID, but it goes back to uh, Afghanistan, goes back to the border crisis, goes back to inflation, goes back to supply chain issues, right? There is no proactive measure. I mean, this guy has been in Congress. He was in Congress for 36 years, right? And then vice president, now the president. I mean, he should have some insight on this stuff. I mean, we mentioned this on our blog, but like he should have some insight on some things to expect, right? Oh, by the way, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Maybe I need to stockpile some masks, some gloves, which I think they're doing, uh, some tests, some vaccinations, and, and be ready to rock and roll. Be ready for another surge. I mean, we know that. Uh, it's the same thing with Afghanistan. It's, it's you know, we and we say it tongue in cheek, but Ukraine and Taiwan, I mean, you know, the more and more we talk about Taiwan, we go back and forth in our, our, our chats and, and, and our texts. Taiwan's done, dude. That's PRC. I mean, I, you know, maybe I'm just like, you know, I hate to be the, the, the half, you know, empty guy, but that, that is PRC. That ship has sailed. It's gone. Uh, and, and you can say you heard it here first or maybe not just here first. Other, other outlets have, have, have brought it up, but we see this coming, but we're going to stand by and do absolutely nothing and be react reactive to it. Luke's been hitting on the Ukraine thing. Uh, I think you were one of the first people that, that kicked out, Hey, another 10,000 troops, you know, but again, Oh, nothing to see here. We're just going to kind of wait and see what happens over here in Ukraine. Hey, uh, if you listen to C3, um, you'll kind of, you kind of already know what's going to happen to the Ukraine or a large part of it, but that's the MO for his in, entire administration. You know, it's, it's the reactiveness, you know, so it's, uh, to me, it's, just, it's unbelievable that one, he's allowed to get away with it. But at what point, and, and Luke, we're talking about, you know, Biden's speech yesterday that, you know, nothing new has come out. It's, uh, but he, he did now, in his credit, he did give Trump for the first time ever, twice, he gave Trump credit for Operation Warp Seed and getting the vaccine out there and this and that. But that is, in my opinion, at this point, uh, one, because of his reactiveness, COVID is now becoming his issue. Right. That was the, that was the second point I was trying to make with that is initially politically, it made sense to keep COVID in the news because everybody still saw it as a Trump thing. Well, now we've had more deaths after vaccinations. And, and dude, it pisses me off because I told you guys this. I'm not a black helicopter guy. I was all on board with it's a vaccine. It's a vaccine. It's a vaccine. Dude, I'm telling you, we've got we, we said it last episode. It, it is no longer a vaccine. OK, Luke called it, you know, months ago, gene therapy, preemptive therapeutic, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it yet. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, ah, uh, yeah, but it, it just kills me. I lose my train of thought. Cause it just makes me so angry this thing, but I want to kick it to you real quick, Luke, uh, just some of your thoughts on his speech. And as far as him taking ownership of COVID, because now it's no longer seen as just a Trump issue. More people have died under his administration than they did under Trump after being vaccinated or after the vaccine has come out. And now I think they're in danger where you say, Hey, it's not the let's talk about COVID because everything else sucks in my administration. It's becoming we can't even talk about COVID anymore because I think the latest polls I saw uh, had like 65 uh, percent of the people disapproved of the way he's handling COVID. Yeah, it's, a, it's a they're in a pickle, man, because uh, COVID's big numbers, right, for the media, for the media, it's big numbers. Uh, but like you said, the Biden administration is going to want to going to have to start downplaying it. And I think they may want to, but that's bad numbers for the media. They're going to have to jump onto something else. And there's, I mean, not other than Ukraine, there's really not much they can jump onto right now. So, uh, yeah, it's, they're, they're in a big pickle. And uh, you said that about me calling it. And, you know, I had to eat some crow a while back uh, because I said early on, ain't going to be no vaccine. They ain't going to be no vaccine. I said that early on. So they can't do it. It's not going to work that quick. And then they came out with the quote unquote vaccine and our favorite lister, Bonnie. See, Luke, you're wrong about everything. You said there wouldn't be a vaccine. And I ate a little crow and I said, yeah, you're right. But, it, you know, I, you're right. I did say that, but I wasn't expecting mRNA technology. Well, now fast forward. It's not a vaccine. Like you said, it's it's gene therapy, man. It's uh, it's a therapeutic. Uh, so yeah, I was right. So f you, Bonnie. You know that's the only time I'm mis. <laughs> the only time I'm mistaken is when I thought I was wrong about something. That's I'm actually mistaken. We were actually right. But you know, to be honest with you, I did not really. Uh, uh, I didn't listen to the speech. Number one, uh, what I was trying to do was get some reflections on the speech. I knew about when it was going to happen. I was driving around all over creation yesterday. I was trying to get some reflections on the news. Okay, what was said? And I think I saw one thing. Biden going to tackle this with more tests. And I'm like, well, okay. And I, we actually had to, uh, HIPAA here, HIPAA, HIPAA, everyone, HIPAA alert. 
we actually had to go out and buy a few COVID tests today for some uh, close acquaintances. And we went to a CVS and the moron at the CVS counters, counters like, we don't have any tests. We've sold out. And the guy was with was like, well, do you know anywhere else in town that has them? No, no. Lubbock is completely sold out of COVID tests. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to believe the uh, CVS worker. Uh, all due respect. We went to across the street to Walgreens. They had tests, you know, floor to ceiling, about $30 each. Uh, all negative tests all around, by the way. But the tests are out there here, at least. I don't know. But yeah, Roger's a good point. I mean, Biden owns COVID now and it, it just he owns it. Um He's going to try to boost his way out of it, but the WHO says you can't boost your way out of this. Uh, it's a big mess. Omicron, like we said, chicken pox parties, man. It's just so, I mean, it's so, to me, okay, what I'm seeing, and this is not medical advice, but from what I'm seeing is very mild, right? And, you know, it's like a, a bad flu, bad cold, uh, real bad, but people are getting through it. Low fatality rate. I think the first death was actually in Texas and it was someone with pre-existing conditions who had actually had COVID before. It's like a double breakthrough or something. Uh, but that's pretty good. You know, one death so far, it's been here for what, three weeks or something, two weeks, one, that's pretty good. I mean, time will tell, but if it really is that mild, I'm talking chicken pox parties, man. Let's let's you know that that signals the virus is on its way out. And we've been saying that again, like we, we sound like a broken record. We've been saying that for a long time when it starts to get way more transmissible, but much less deadly. That signals kind of the beginning of the end. And here's the thing this is what I was telling a friend earlier. It's like if we do the wrong thing right now, which is locked down, everybody locks down and, you know, 14 more days to slow the spread, turn into three months and we close things down and things. That's the absolute worst thing we could do right now because that signals to the virus time to get more deadly time to get less transmissible, but more deadly. It'll mutate again. Let's let it run its course. I don't know. I feel like I really, again, feel like a broken record. We talk about this so much, but unfortunately it's just in the news. Um, yeah, so Roger, real quick, or Josh, if either one of y'all know, Roger made a bet, and I was like, dude, that's the safest bet in the history of betting. <laughs> he goes, bet that as soon as Biden is done with his speech, he's off to uh, Delaware for a week or two. Do, do y'all know if he actually did that? Hold on, I'm trying to gurgle it. I mean, where else would he go? I mean, what else would he do? I mean, I think that's that's a very, very safe bet. Yeah, I saw that. So I saw that text. It was like, you know, bet. I was like, I was going to respond back with water is wet, you know, or, or something like that. Because they do. They, yeah, of course he is. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know. Go ahead, Roger. Well, and it's crazy because South Africa now, where it was first reported, is now six weeks into this. And by all accounts, they are on the backward slope of this thing, on the downward slope, right? They're on the back end of it. It's clearing up. And listening to Joe's speech yesterday, we're going to ramp out all this stuff. And, and of course, they won't be available till after January. Hey, the first reported case was the first week of December for us. Um, guess what? Here come uh, Christmas and next week, we should be on the backside. But like Luke, you just mentioned, hey, you kind of let it run its course. And it's funny because it takes me back to you know the Trump years. Some of the pundits, some of the doctors out there were actually throwing that out there. They were like, hey. This is, and, and Fauci even uh, addressed it. They're like, hey, this is more transmissible, uh, but way less deadly, way less lethal. So maybe we kind of, you know, let this become the dominant strain, right? And oh. everybody catches it. And Fauci basically just came out and said, well, that's just a dangerous game to play. And now you're starting to see it more and more where people are like, Wait a minute. And so it reminds me of the Trump years. I kick it to you, Josh. It reminds me of the Trump years where he would throw something out there and people are like, no, that's crazy. It's all nuts. And then, hey, you let it simmer for a couple of weeks and you're like, eh, that actually makes a lot of sense. And now you're, you're starting to see it on the mainstream media to where, well, hey, why don't we just let Omicron, you know, like you said, chicken pox parties. Let's let's throw the doors open. Everybody go out. You know, hopefully if you're vaccinated or booster one, two, three, four, five, six, Pfizer pill, Monoclo, all that other good stuff. And let's just go out there and get it. Don't get it, whatever, and, and be over this thing. Yeah, it's insane. And it's important to note that, uh, you know, it is much less deadly. Uh, 
so you notice how when you know when COVID first started, and uh, especially you know in Italy, uh, you know all you heard was the death count, right? Have X, you know, X number of people died today uh, from uh, from COVID, and then. After it made its way to the States, it was like, people die, people die, people die. And, well, not as many people died as they predicted. So then it turned into, well, this many new cases, right? And that's what we, you know, people started basing protocols on. It was number of cases, number of cases. And Delta showed up and, you know, some few more people died. And it was like, oh, they, they, they started to count death rates again real quick. But then they realized that it wasn't going to be nearly as bad as they thought it was. So they went back to counting cases. You know what they're counting with, with Omicron? They're counting cases. Do you know why? Because it's less mild. You know, it's like the doctor in South Africa who first, you know, sounded yep. the alarm about it, came out and was like, hey, man, super transmissible, not even remotely close to, uh, you know, to to being a, a deadly strain, um, you know. And we, we've harped on it and we've harped on it and we've harped on it. Um, and, dude, I am so sick of people who are obviously who are visually clearly not healthy and i'm talking about out of shape because they eat at bojangles 15 times a week virtue signaling that they can't believe that people are unvaccinated and how people aren't wearing masks and they don't care they're and they are they are the ones that are going to overwhelm the hospitals let me clue you people in on something Heart disease, number one killer, kills 650,000 Americans a year. And guess what? You don't care about overwhelming a hospital with your bow box and your extra bow sauce. You don't care about overwhelming a hospital by using a Krispy Kreme donut as your hamburger bun. You don't care about that. But that does a virtue signal, right? Because when you, you know, when you tell people, you know, when you, when you question somebody's eating habits and stuff, then you, you know, then that that's mean and that's, you know, microaggressions and people got to go to their safe space and, and this, that, and the other. It's, it's complete bullshit. And dude, these people, they, they're the worst. They're absolutely the worst. It's like, you got, you, man, remember when we were in, uh, Remember where you're the debt? And you ever go to the, uh, did you guys ever run over to the GNC inside the PX? Yeah. Yeah. I went in there. Yeah. So, you know, I'd always go to the GNC to, you know, grab some no explode, you know, cause, uh, cause that was the thing. Cause everybody's desk looked like a science experiment and, you know, grab some no explode and some, and some protein powder or some creatine. And one of the people that worked in there, it was like, well, have you, are do you have your multis? Have you, are you, have, do you have this? Are you taking this? And you're looking at him. It's like, do you know where a gym is? Like, have you ever exercised a day <laughs> in your life? Cause dude, it was, I mean, like bad, man, like bad. And it was like, okay, you know, maybe, maybe you have a, a medical condition that, you know, makes you like that. That's okay. I, you know, I get that. I understand that. But if I was GNC, man, I was like, I probably wouldn't want that person working, you know, the storefront. Um, Cause I'm probably, they're probably not going to sell me a whole lot of stuff. Um, you know, unless you do but, like the reverse advertising. Hey, if you don't take this, you'll look like, <laughs> this. Yeah. Right? yeah, dude, it's the same thing. It's the same thing in Vegas. You know, you talk about cognitive, like dissonance, like walking through Vegas, the casino where they're yelling at you. So they get the security guard at the elevator. So as soon as you step off the elevator, you get to put the mask on because to save your life. Right. And then what happens when you walk into a Vegas casino, it's these plumes of smoke everywhere because people were smoking so i can pull my mask down and don't have to wear a mask because i'm smoking but not because of the covid i'm just like you're telling me this is like my brain can't comprehend that like i'm sitting here and i'm like you're telling me i have to put this mask on to save my life and then there are you know the fog of war is in front of me it's so thick with cigarette smoke with people not wearing their masks uh because they're it's allowed to smoke it doesn't make sense it's not about, it's not about health. It's not about health. It's oh, about not. control. I got a quick story. What happened today? Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll throw it over to Luke, you know? So again, like we were out stimulating the economy and, uh, we stopped for lunch at Cava. Um, and you know, we walked in and there's people sitting down eating no mask and all the workers are in masks, except for probably, you know, there, there's a couple who have it pulled down under their nose because, 
you know, science. And, uh, you know, they're like, do you have masks? Like, <laughs> nope. I basically, long story short is we didn't have masks. Uh, they told us we could walk over to Whole Foods and, uh, and purchase masks. I was like, okay, absolutely not doing that. Um, so we had to go, we, we went and ate somewhere else. Um, so my, you know, I, I, I'm still trying to understand how, if it's so deadly that I have to wear a mask just to, you know, enter, enter the, the business, but yet I can go sit in a chair and take my mask off and I'm not required to wear a mask. I'll have to wear it when I'm standing up. Right. Cause you got to, it was also, you know, it was one of those places where you have to wear it. If you get up to go to the bathroom, you have to put it on and you're just like this, like, this is not science. Like, this is just, this is just effing nonsense. Um, it's about control. That's all it is. It's about control. Uh, dude, I haven't had COVID yet. No, um, that I know of. I, I, I want to go get the antibodies test to see if I, see if I have had it, uh, potentially, but dude, I haven't had it. You know what? I'm not afraid of getting it. Like, I'm just going to start going around licking doorknobs. Maybe I can get Omicron and uh, and and be done with it. Um, well, that's because you finished 75 hard. You were a little scared before 75 hard started, though. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, haven't been scared. Um, I don't know, Luke. I don't know how we. Uh, I don't know how we come out of this. Like, I don't know how we we write the ship uh, that is the uh, the the prevalent stupidity of uh, of the American people on this they just need to suffer josh that's that's all there is <laughs> i think I, I, well i'd say that half jokingly. i don't know man times have changed i don't see it like uh the america the american and I, for the most part the western global psyche has been i'm not gonna say irreparably harmed but it's harmed and it's changed i mean the conversation we had tonight um i had to step away about you know, going to see family and stuff, it wouldn't have been a conversation three years ago. It's just the the permutations you have to put yourself through. Uh, and we're not the only ones. We're not unique. This is everyone. Uh, it, it's, it's, I don't know. It's not going away. Uh, this, this mindset, the, the masks, uh, masks on a plane forever. Well, if it just saves just one life, there's a flu season every year. I mean, uh, I, I'm just tired of thinking about it, man. I'm tired of thinking about it. And I'm going to tell a, a quick, Kind of, kind of feel good Christmas story. Um, you know, Josh, <laughs> I wish Josh all the luck in the world. I keep thinking about it every year. Dude waits until Mary's water breaks to go do the Christmas shopping, and I, I wish him all the luck in the world. But <laughs> <laughs> we were, we were out today picking up COVID tests and, and thermometers, and uh, once again, everyone's fine. Uh, but we just want to be on the safe side. Um, so we we went into the grocery store, H E B. I. I Anyone who's been in the HEB, it's a magical place, man. I love HEB. Uh, just go to HEB, just walk around and love it. This is what Target was like in uh, 2005. Remember walking into a Target 2000? You just felt good about yourself. I don't know. So we walk in and, you know, people doing their shopping, getting their last minute briskets and hams and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, you know, I'm going to check out, ended up getting more stuff that I needed. Uh, you know, we got more beer than we needed, you know, more meat than we needed. Yeah, it's nice. And I, I stand there in line and somebody, uh, you know, the lines were kind of long and the, uh, the, the helper lady at the back, the H E B lady, uh, motions this couple over. They had two young kids and she goes, this line will move pretty quick because I only had like maybe 25 items. And I look at the guy and I go, this line is not going to move quick, bro. I'm staying, I'm paying with an out of state third party check and a traveler's <laughs> check. And he laughed, you know, cause I, you know, at this time of year, I really try to be nice to people. Cause a lot of times I just, I hate people, but this time of year, I'm like, I'm going to be nice to people, you know, give them like a feel good, you know? And the guy was just like super nice back. And his wife was really nice. His kids were well-behaved and he joked with me. And this dude had like the cauliflower ears from hell. And he was in, he's a, a shorter guy, but really good shape. Obviously an MMA guy, you know, he's a little bit older, maybe 29, 30. And, uh, he was just a really nice guy and his wife was very polite. And like I said, his kids were super well behaved. So I, uh, I introduced, I said, what gym do you work out at? And he said, Oh, I work out at all of them, you know? And he, he knew the names of all the gyms. And I was like, man, this guy's just a great guy. You know, I like seeing people like this. So I, I told the H E B guy, I grabbed one of the, uh, gift cards and I said, Hey, can you put $50 on that? Yeah, sure. He puts $50 on it. And I said, Hey, you know, I leaned over. I said, Hey, as soon as these people, you know, start to check out give them this gift card, apply it to their, 
to their basket. And he's like, oh, man, that's great. But this dude, I shook his hand one more time, said Merry Christmas, kind of a surprise, like you pay for somebody in line before you or whatever after you. And uh, this guy's name is Derek Campos. And he goes, I say, he goes, I'm Derek. I said, I'm Luke. Maybe, you know, in 2022, I'll finally get off my ass and go roll around at some of the gyms. He goes, well, my name's Derek Campos. He goes, you know, I said, well, I knew you were a fighter. And he goes, yeah, look me up. You know, he wasn't bragging. He's got, just look me up. It's like, okay, cool. So I go out in the parking lot and type in Derek Campos. This guy is a former Bellator featherweight champion. Holy smokes. And super nice guy, you know, fights at 145, but dude was walking around at 165 and dude was cut. He looked good. <laughs> and, but man, I was just like, man, that dude would roll you up. But he was so nice. You know, a guy like that has every reason in the world to be a jerk and be cocky. Uh, but he was, he was nice. I hope they have a Merry Christmas. So shout out to uh, Derek Campos. Um, shout out to What's Elaine that? and John. What's that? Derek? Are, are you, are you, are you challenging him to a, to no, a little fight there? No, 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 no. <laughs> Dude, sponsored by, let, let, let's see three, let's see three promote this thing here. Yeah. Hey, we could get him on the show. How about that? Hey, look, he lives dude, in I, Lubbock. I got it right here. You caught him a big pussy in the comments. No. I will actually screenshot that and put it up <laughs> on our blog. Uh, for all of our viewers out there. <laughs> so I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give him a shout out. Maybe we'll try to get Derek Campos on the show. And he could tell us what it's like to be a professional MMA fighter. And uh, shout out to Elaine and John. I don't know if John listens every week, but Elaine listens every week. And I have not given her a shout out. So thanks, Elaine. Uh, I'm going to uh, kick it to Roger. And then maybe and then somebody wants to give a final shout out right before we close out. Sounds good. Hey, the uh, the last thing I kind of wanted to bring up the the other topic that, dude, I love it because we actually see eye to eye or we saw eye to eye with the squad for one minute. So everybody remembers you got two big bills, right? You've got the infrastructure bill and then you got the build back better bill. So you got the the BBB, and remember the squad and the progressive left were hijacking. Uh, the vote because they wanted to immediately vote uh, on the BBB and they sat there and they, Oh, look, look at this. We're going to have a special guest here, but they, the squad was actually hijacking the, the vote, uh, for the infrastructure bill because they wanted to do both at the same time. And the democratic leadership, uh, came out and said, no, 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 we're good. We'll just do it one at a time. We promise, we promise we'll vote on BBB as soon as we get the infrastructure bill done. And, you know, the squad went back and forth for, it, it was at least a week or two, if not longer, Josh, that they were like, ah, nope, nope, we don't trust you. You guys are a bunch of liars. You're going to, you're just going to let us vote on this one. You're going to push the other one off. And they're like, no, no, we, we promise, you know, Schumer and Pelosi, we promise, we promise we're going to vote on both. And what happens? They, so they said, okay, okay. They, they vote on the infrastructure bill. It passes. Uh, BBB is getting ready to come up and guess what happens? <laughs> they don't vote on it. <laughs> they got yeah. screwed. And you know what? They knew they got screwed. And before I kick it to you, it's everybody wants to blame it on Manchin, right? And they say, Oh, it's just one, you know, the one guy, he's not a Democrat and this and that. And, and, and you know, look at how they're going after him. But it's like, no, you're failing to see the broader picture where it's not one Democrat. It was also 50 other Republican senators, uh, what we also call the majority, right? So you had 51 senators vote against it or opt not to vote uh, on the BBB. But dude, did we call that out? They, they, were, yeah. they were, for for one minute there, one minute, the squad and C3 were on par. Like we both, like you were going to get screwed on this. And they saw it. They knew they were going to get screwed. Yeah. No, that 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 was actually that was that was pretty funny. Uh, they, you know, like you said, they they knew it was going to happen. They uh, they were hoping that you know at the last minute or something, Manson was or one of the Republicans really was going to uh, you know jump ship. But it, it, yeah, it, you know they're like, oh, it was you know one Democrat and everybody's you know it's got the the pitchforks and torches out for Joe Manchin. And it was like, no, it was a majority. Like that's how it works. Uh, you know, that's that's how the. That's how the Senate works. Um, that's kind of, you know, it, it's baked in uh, by this thing called the Constitution. And uh, hey, man, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It was great to uh, to see the Build Back Better bill go down uh, because it was bad. It's bad for the United States. It's bad for America. Um, and they keep, you know, now there's people like, I mean, there are people actively stalking Joe Manchin now. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, hey, man, it's like, you know, you, you already have him you know, as probably one of the most moderate Dems in the, uh, in, in, uh, in Congress writ large. Um, and it's like, you, you want to keep pushing him, you know, to the point where he's either going to a come out as an independent or B he's going to come out and just be like, 
fine. I'm a Republican. Um, I'm switching parties. And then you've lost that, you know, you've lost that seat because in West Virginia likes him. You know, I was looking at some of the polls and stuff like that. Oh, a yeah. lot of people in West Virginia approve of how he's, you know, how he's legislating uh, because he is, you know, he's not a lot of, you know, a lot of elected officials are, you know, well, this is what the party's doing. It's not about the party. It's about your constituents, you know? That you are there representing your constituents. You're not there representing the, you know, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party. You're there representing your constituents, and that's your job. That's what you're elected to do. Um, that's you know, kind of supposed to be how this thing works. So, yeah, no, it was uh, it was pretty good. So, we have uh, we have been been graced with a uh, with a special guest here. Um, I don't know if you I don't know if you want to go by a party name. Um, are you going to throw your real name out there, uh, or what, but, uh, you know what, what I want to hear is I want to hear the most embarrassing Luke story that you got. That's not going to get you, you know, that's not going to get you like written out of a will or, you know, voted off the Island or, you know, get all your Christmas presents thrown into the fire. Oh man, that's gosh, where do I even begin? Man, y'all, throw it out there. I'm trying to think of a good one. There's been a couple. <laughs> There's been a couple. When I was first meeting Luke, I, I just remember that <laughs> there were a few instances of him just telling stories in front of my friends where they weren't receptive really very well to them. And there was one one time when he came to lunch with me and my friends were sitting with me at lunch. And we're all pretty young, I'm middle schoolers right now. And he's he's telling us, he's like, hey, uh, like trying to relate to the youth. He's like, you guys, you guys want to hear a cool story? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's hear it. And he's like, okay, here's a story about how a baboon killed a man once. And my friends just go silent. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I'm entertained by it. I think it's funny. Um, but they're, they, they don't at all. And they're just sitting there like blank faced, not having heard anything like this ever before in their lives. And I, I'm laughing it off, but Luke's obviously very embarrassed by the moment. And he goes through and he talks about every detail of how this baboon killed a man. I think it was somewhere in <laughs> South America and no, and everybody's just like, who is this person? Like, what, what is he doing? Why is he tell, telling us this? Friends are pulling out their phones. They're like nine one one. They're like, yeah. how stranger? How do danger. I escape a weird conversation with a weird man? <laughs> Luke, but, Luke's trying to trying to relate to the Utes. They'd be like, what'd you Utes. say? He'd be like the Utes. The oh, Utes. I can. Yeah, I can. <laughs> uh, I can see that now. So, you guys, uh, you're co you're you're COVID free. Um, COVID free. A little bit of a uh, <laughs> little bit of a scare this morning mm-hmm start yeah. pinging around yeah um that's good so yeah. how long uh how long are you guys in town for uh well uh, we're kind of debating on when we'll be going uh to visit family for christmas now if we're gonna stay here if we'll go and travel to see them so i'll be i'll be in the state uh gosh until the 27th of december so a few more days tell them about how you think all 12 bravos should go away I don't think they should go away. I just think they will eventually. <laughs> that was that was something I was talking about last night. Yeah. Yeah, you think yeah. they'll go away? Why do you think that? I think just from I mean, I don't obviously have that much experience with uh the engineer regiment as a whole, but I I've done a couple of live fires with an infantry battalion and have run through a lot of breaches, a lot of like triple strand, um, sea wire breaches and as complicated and as dangerous as demolitions are. Um, they're teachable. They're very teachable. And 12 Bravos like demonstrate that because they come in and they're, it's not like they have a higher IQ than any sort of 11 Bravo that you see running around. Yeah. (laughs) Everybody's about on the same level when it comes to, just like capabilities. No, they're not. And, no, nah. they're not. I was a recruiter. I can I can bust out some yeah. some ASVAB scores on twelve Bravos. Roger 12? Roger put a uh, mentally disabled person in the army. Dude, I thought I almost got caught <laughs> like ten years later. <laughs> I I feel like there's recruiters with similar stories that, from soldiers that I've personally met. So I just <laughs> I, I don't think you're alone in that at all. 
<laughs> but hey, you know what? If they if they would need a job, like now they got a job and they have benefits. I don't know. I mean, I'd say you actually did them a favor. But <laughs> see, that's what I am talking about. She's yeah. a patriot. Josh sent me that, so I didn't know he was autistic. First of all, because I'm not a doctor, and the army says that I don't make that right. determination. But he sent right. me that article where the recruiter got busted, and I kind of chuckled at first. I was like, "Oh shit, I need to check the dates on this thing." And I was really like, "Oh, right, not me, oh, no. not me." Yeah, oh yeah, no. A- yeah, because they they found this kid who was autistic in the army. And they were going back. They're like, no, we're finding the recruiter who put him in. And they they were gonna oh, think wow. you know talking about uh, talking about UCMJ and the recruiter. And well, Roger was mm-hmm. looking up uh, statute of limitations on some stuff there. Uh, <laughs> see what was yeah. see what was shaken. So, well, so I mean, if you been, if uh, you don't know, you don't know. But there sorry. you go. I didn't know. Oh, no, no, Roger I didn't knew. Know. But you knew. You even, dude, the story you told about the first time you met him, you're like, oh yeah, this kid was definitely on the spectrum. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, but how many times do we say that? You know? (laughs) Yeah. No, that's that's a good point. Good point. Um, Mm -hmm. So you've been up, uh, you've been up there for what, a year and a half now? Yeah. Two years now? Well, I've been, now I've been in the army for about a year and a half, but I've been at my duty station for about a year now. Okay. A little over a year. Yeah. So you get you still got a little more a little more time before they look to uh, look to mm. move you. Oh so yeah. So what's so what's next? We uh, we doing sapper school? We doing ranger school? Hundred uh, percent. Yeah. Doing? Sapper is my next short term goal that I'm gonna start working towards once I get back from NTC. So start the train Oof. up. It's hard to start training for sapper school before you go to NTC because usually you just end up losing all of the traction that you gained. So. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the next thing. That's the next thing on the list for sure. Yeah. Hey, if you go back and you listen to our episode with uh, we had a minute from Mo that turned into a, a freaking marathon. Mm-hmm. He graduated Sapper School, so if he can graduate Sapper School, well, I'll just cut it off and leave it right there. But Mo graduated Sapper School, so you you, you, okay. you should be all right. Okay, was, there it is. <laughs> Mo, Mo was the autistic child that. Uh, <laughs> <in the army. laughs> nice. Hey, they're I highly you. intelligent though. So I love I love you, Mo. <laughs> The, uh, I know we're just bagging on 12 Bravos and we're just joking, but got a question for you. So what's the, and I know when I was young in the military, especially as a private coming up and, and this and that, uh, I, I couldn't read so well. So I, I never made it through the O ranks. Um, but coming up being, uh, you know, young adult at that time, wasn't really into a whole lot of politics with the administration and this and that. And I don't want to get too personal as far as your personal thoughts, and this and that I got, you know, you're still on duty, active duty, but from what you see and what you perceive, I mean, are the soldiers, both enlisted, warrant officers, uh, commission officers, uh, are they that in tune with what's going on right now in the government as far as the, the new administration? Or is it pretty much, you know, hey, man, you know, you're in the Army. So like you said, you're focused on NTC. So like all I give a shit about is NTC. I've got things. I got trained up for this and that. You're off to, tra- you know, sapper school. What, what's the overall involvement, I guess, of, of the soldiers that, that you work with? That's a great question. Um, I, know I think I a asked. lot. Of, yeah, it's it's great. It's good. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, it could be better, but I I think a lot of service members get really exhausted with having opinions because it's constantly shot down. You know, you're you're kind of just on the grind all the time, and when you start to have personal beliefs about decisions that are being made on levels that are a lot higher than you can even influence or even think about. It gets frustrating. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I see a lot of jokes being thrown around, you know, typically you still see um, most, I I would say most service members leaning more conservatively. Um, So a lot of, you can imagine like what the opinions are and what the perspectives are just within this administration and all the decisions that have been made. But for the majority, I, I don't have a lot of politically charged conversations. Um, and maybe that's because I am in the role I am in as an officer and as a platoon leader. And I don't overhear them as much because people don't want to involve me in them. But uh, you you have a lot of people that are very disenfranchised with leadership right now. Um, and I think it it leads to them maybe not feeling as passionate about certain issues or situations that come up because they're just like well this is my job you know if I bring in my opinions and I let them influence how I feel about my job then I can't do my job as well so 
I don't know if that answers your questions very well, but no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and well said, and it's always cause old, old folks like us, you know, it's, we remember what the army was like and then now we've been removed for several years. So you kind of wonder if it's still the same way or, you know, as a new generation comes, you know, goes forward. Uh, one last question I want to ask you is, uh, being a female and a, cause we do have female listeners out there. Uh, my daughter, like I said, she's on a roll. I think she's on episode two now. Um, so being a female in a male dominated MOS, uh, you know, cause back in the day there were no females in that, that, uh, those type of units. Uh, do you find that challenging? Do you see it's more, I guess, do you see, are there any, as far as your interactions and, and you being an officer, commission officer and then the orders that you give, uh, do you find that the respect and the discipline is more based on your merit or do you, do you feel any friction because, well, you're a female in a male dominated unit? I mean, what's your, what is your perception of that? I, I would say the respect is about the same. So you walk in as a second lieutenant, you're a second lieutenant, you're a butter bar, you don't know anything, you know, and you kind of, ha- you have to earn it just like anybody else. So I wouldn't, say that experience is any different um, because I'm a female, but the way that I build relationships with like my platoon sergeant, with my squad leaders, with my commander, with uh, my peers is uh, at least within this last year has been extremely difficult for me because they don't feel comfortable completely opening up and um, having a more, more of a peer to peer relationship with me. Instead it's, there's this wall where it's like, well, I, I have to watch what I say. I have to, kind of walk on eggshells around me um, because I'm a female and I may get offended by something, even though I, I make an effort to let them know that I'm not like that. I don't, I'm not sensitive to every little thing that comes out of someone's mouth. Um, But that's been probably the most difficult thing that I didn't really expect is the, just the dynamics of the relationships, like personal and professional within the workplace has proved itself to, yeah. Between me, you, and Josh here. So, what do you think of the sergeant major? Oh, my sergeant major. Yeah. Or what? It, it's actually it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> he he's an interesting guy. He's probably the most technically and tactically competent person you've ever met, right? I'll take your silence as a he's yes. He's very very technically competent so he he you don't have to answer that yeah he came from a november world which is the world of construction and he's in a uh like a brigade engineer battalion underneath a bct so his experience with the engineers has been vastly different from the way that we train and what we do as sappers and as combat engineers so that that definitely shows and i think that's something that's unique maybe to engineers, but, um, yeah, it's (laughs) every Sergeant major I've met has been honestly very different from each other. I met, um, a really great one a few weeks back, but you (laughs) met a really great one like here now, but anyway, just remember this whenever in doubt before I turn it back over to Josh, just remember whenever in doubt, there's only two ranks in the army that have stars in them. One's a Sergeant major. With that being said, Josh, and neither one of those ranks are worth really anything um, <laughs> that that have stars in them, to uh, to be honest. So my question is, how are the warrants that you've met and are interacted with? How okay, how has been? Those... She's never interacted with a warrant, first of all, because they they're probably not around. Hey, look, man. <laughs> hey, you know what, Chief Chief shows up when Chief is needed, and when Chief's not needed, Chief ain't there because NCOs are the backbone, or they lead the way, or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> so, what's been your experience with uh, with the warrants? Warrants, honestly, have been. I it's they've been ones that I've leaned on, um, like pretty consistently as far as maintenance goes, and then construction goes. We have two <laughs> really great warrants. I haven't had any. Any, I don't know, and I don't know if there are combat engineer warrant officers. Maybe there are. No, no. Uh, I don't so, think. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there are. Yeah, I think in mm-hmm. in an engineer. Yeah, you're you're gonna find them. You know, in the motor pool, the maintenance uh, warrants, mm-hmm. and uh, you know some of the construction stuff. Yeah, you, combat engineers don't have a, a warrant field. Any yeah. of them uh, yeah. fall over when you were leaning on them? Just curious. Uh you know, sometimes they'd push me down. So <laughs> they, uh, they wouldn't really hey, fall over, but <laughs> I'd end up on Roger, my face. 
<laughs> Roger, it's okay, man. It's okay. You just need to admit that Sergeant Major is one. It's a useless rank. Um, they're they're Sergeant Majors. No, I'm serious. Like the Sergeant Major role is generally useless because in the big army, when you go to combat, guess who doesn't have a role when you when you deploy? Your Sergeant Major. Warrant officers. No, warrant officers. Right? I don't know. Every deployment I've been on hey, is a warrant officer. I got the guide yeah, on, dude. I don't know what the hell you're doing out there. I got the guide on. All right. Because because you're because you're your guide on. I really... will say though, I do believe that the role of the sergeant major uh, or sergeant's major, as you get up to brigade and division, I mean, I don't know why they exist. I actually do see a, a role at the battalion level. Uh, I'm not sure. Like when you get to brigade and division and corps, like I'm not sure the role of the sergeant major uh, at that level. So I don't, I, I don't opinion. know what the role of the the battalion sergeant major is, other than making sure people well, don't walk on the grass. I don't know what the role of a CW two, three, four, five is either. So this is what it is. Well, yeah. Other, than I think being I think the, a sergeant major is kind of like a morale mascot. If I had to, <laughs> <laughs> call me a mascot. All right, I look here, it. lieutenant. I love it in the best look. way possible. In the Look, and I mean that just so sincerely. <laughs> I uh yeah no that was best. You know what that that was probably the best thing that's been said on uh, the cup since uh, <laughs> we started this thing, right there. Um, yeah, no, that, that, so you know, yeah. Now your warrants, your warrants should be uh, should be good if you come across a dirt bag warrant. Uh, make sure all the other warrants know that they're a dirt bag because uh, they shouldn't be a warrant officer. It was some NCO that slipped through the cracks. Uh, we, we don't like them. Yeah, NCOs, just, uh, you know, I don't know. No, nah, it's all good. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with one piece of advice. Uh, actually, two pieces of advice. First, don't worry about your report card. Uh, take care of your folks and get your job done. The report card will take care of itself after that. And uh, if at first you don't succeed, do it the way Chief told you to to begin with. <laughs> Whatever. <Very good. laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Anyway, it was a pleasure finally getting you on here. I know we've been talking about it for a year, but it's always very sensitive because you have active duty members and, you know, you're not necessarily at liberty one way or another to come out and express your, you know, all your personal thoughts and opinions. So we definitely appreciate you coming out here. Uh, thank you for serving. Uh, I know a lot of people say it lightheartedly no. and, you know, it becomes the, uh, you know, it's like Merry Christmas. What do you, do you really mean Merry Christmas? Like, well, no, we actually, you know, thank you for serving because especially at your age and for sure. when you look at what the political climate is and, and, and then the social climate out there, it's, uh, you know, I can tell you as a recruiter, it, it becomes, or as a former recruiter, uh, more and more difficult to find young men and women that are one qualified, but, uh, but then truly motivated to, to come in because it is a, you know, a lot of people don't realize the sacrifices that all service members uh, make, uh, whether they do four years, they do, you know, 14 or, or 24 years, but there is a time period there where, which you're realizing now that your life is not yours. Uh, so, you know, we definitely thank you for your service and, 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 you know, best wishes for everything you do and above all, uh, you know, definitely stay, uh, stay safe out there. All right. Uh, we'd Absolutely. like to definitely have you back on and we're not just talking about combat. We're talking about from COVID. So make sure you get the army's vaccine when that E4, mm -hmm. that specialist <laughs> med guy over at the TMC, uh, who probably created or gal created that vaccine. Don't forget to be uh, first in line there and, you know, lead the way. Oh, oh, I, oh I, got, I got one last thing. I got one last thing. Have you, to this point, made made Luke put on one of his old uniforms and locked his heels? <laughs> no, not yet. He told me, I guess I, I was going to ask him to be my first salute, and he's like, I don't salute anyone below major. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to test that. I'm not going to test that. We'll he, wait. I'll wait. He didn't want your, we'll see. He, did, he didn't want your silver coin? Did you give did you uh, give the it, first person a silver coin? It didn't end up actually happening because uh COVID kind of canceled the at least the formal part of the commissioning ceremony that I had. I did it over Zoom and raised my oh, right man. hand to a camera screen, so that was nice. But, oh god. Oh, yeah. by the way, yeah, I'm glad uh we almost forgot. That glass that you bought him, the C three glass, that was super, oh, yeah. super cool. Yes. Yeah. You know what you noticed that it wasn't just a C, it was C three, right? Oh, there, yeah, I can't. Three of us. I have sometimes I have trouble counting that high. So Did, I, I'm you sure are, Luke forgot kinda, to give you. You are a lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> he forgot to give you our addresses. That's fine. Uh, I'll yeah. text him my address. So you know. Perfect. Christmas yeah. Thank right you. The corner. Absolutely. <laughs> so with that being said, thanks for coming on, Josh. You got any last words before you close this thing out? Nope. 
Merry Christmas. Oh. All righty, folks. We want to wish everybody out there a Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Hanukkah, all that other good stuff. Enjoy your time off. Be safe. Uh, you know, definitely head over to the website, uh, culperscanteencup.com. And thanks again to Carlton Zeus for the intro music, www.carltonzeus.com or on Apple Music. So, canteeners, stay safe and keep your canteen cups tightly secured. <laughs>